You bow your heads with me, please. Father God, we thank you that you have gone before us, that you are there in the midst of it all, and that your plan for us is so much greater than anything we can think of on our own. Lord, I ask you to be with those that are here today. Let their hearts be receptive, their minds be understanding, and their ears hear the words that you have chosen for me to speak today, Father. We just thank you for that. Those that aren't here, Father, bless them. Let them come back faithfully next week. Be with them in their travels. Uh, if anyone is ill that we don't know about, Lord, I ask you to step in, Father, and, and put your healing presence in their lives because that's exactly what you do. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and we rejoice in that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, watch your eyes while Karen turns on the lights. And uh, you guys get uh, lucky today because Rebecca is doing double duty since James decided to go turkey hunting. And he got one, so that's always a good thing. All right, uh, more announcements. Let's see if you can keep up with me. Ready? All right. Uh, giving made easy. You guys know all this. There's a basket by the door. You can give online at findtransformation.com slash giving. Text the word transformation 830-293-4483, or you can do it on our app. Speaking of our, oh, well, we got Facebook first. There we go. Facebook first. If you haven't checked in yet, please do so. Uh, those that uh, have been doing it, it's been working great. Uh, we've had a lot of people start some conversations with me, at least, uh, asking about the church. So check in on Facebook. We'd love to see you do that. Just, you know how that works. All right. Prayer. We always love to pray for you. You can text the word prayer to 830-293-4483. Or if you have my cell phone, just text me like some of you do. I love being able to pray for you. That's exactly what we should do. All right. Got our app. Did that do it or did you do it? You did it. She did it good. I'm telling you. If you haven't downloaded our app yet, go to the Google Play or Apple Store. Download Church by Ministry One. Search for Transformation Church Kerrville. And there you go. Next week, week five of our six-week series, Against All Odds, he entered triumphantly. But today, we're going to talk about how he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. So I hope you all had a great week. Everybody have a good week? Yep? Okay, good. All right. Let's get started. We've been walking through the story of the hours leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Incidents that were predicted by the prophet Isaiah 700 years before they happened. Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would be betrayed by his friends. That he would remain silent while he was accused. And that he would be counted among criminals. We've talked about that the last three weeks. Today, we're going to see him become sheep-like. As Isaiah said, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. So our main text for today is going to be Isaiah 53, 7. If you have your Bibles, great. If not, it's right up here for you. It says, he was oppressed <laughs> and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. All right, I want you to imagine something, if you would. Take this year, 2022. Subtract 700 years from that. For you math whizzes, if you don't have it already, that year was 1322. So in 1322, the Battle of Borough Bridge took place as the first war in the Scottish independence. The Jewish people were exiled from France for the third time in 1322. And King Philip V, referred to as the tall king of France, died in that same year. What are the odds that anyone in the year 1322 could have predicted that Russia would be invading the Ukraine as they are today? Or that people cared about their animals' lives more than that of unborn children? Or even how children would be allowed to choose their own sex because that's what the parents thought they wanted to do. Yet Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, predicted not only his death, but that his death, he would act like a lamb led to the slaughter. What are those odds? What are the odds that the Messiah would be a lamb? Yet it happened. All four of the Gospels recognize the analogy. Matthew said, and led him away to crucify him. 
Mark wrote, they led him out to crucify him. Luke said, as they led him away. And John says, as they took Jesus away. You see, Jesus was a carpenter by trade. He spent 17 years of his life cutting wood, chiseling stone, and building buildings with his father. He was a well-built man. You don't see many carpenters that can do all that that aren't. But he allowed a bunch of pew-sitting priests to lead him up the Kidron Valley to the place of his death. Like the shepherds were doing that very same day with sheep that they were bringing from Bethlehem to be <coughs> sacrificed at the temple. See, that was on Friday. They sacrificed that night. Jesus was led the very same way. No one could have guessed it, but the story was foreshadowed because if you understood it, the story of the Bible is a story of the Lamb. If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis 3, chapter 3. If you don't, we're going to put some up on the board here. See, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. They were naked, but they weren't ashamed. God had given them everything they needed with one restriction. And those of you that are in freedom class, we talk about that. One thing, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said, if you did, you will surely die. But with Satan's help, they ate anyway. Scripture says they looked around and realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. We all know that God was in the habit of walking with Adam and Eve in the evening uh, in the Garden of Eden, and they heard him coming, and what did they do? They hid. They panicked. They found a bush, and they buried themselves behind it. Have you ever done anything that you've tried to hide from God? You can't. He knew where they were. But the scene goes from comic, or from tragic to comic, because really, how do you hide from God. You can't. Scene kind of went, Adam, where are you? Adam says, well, I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you were naked? You didn't eat from the tree, did you? And it was at that moment, that very moment, church, that the human blame game was born. Adam pointed to his wife and said, she made me do it. He pointed to the serpent and said, he made me do it. It was that very moment when we should have died, but the Bible says differently. God provided an animal skin to cover Adam and Eve. So follow me for a minute. Look at Genesis 3, 21. It says, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Where do you suppose God got those animal skins? From a carcass of an animal. So in order to redeem Adam and Eve's shame, he killed an animal on their behalf. That animal's life became a substitute for their lives. Starting to sound familiar? Hold on to that for a minute. Let's look at Genesis 22 real quick. In Genesis 21, let me set this up. Abraham had a son. We've, we've talked about this before. His son was Isaac. He was promised to Abraham for years and years and years, and he finally had him. So he waited 25 years for Isaac to be born. And as we look at chapter 22, it says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Abraham doesn't understand this. He doesn't know why God wants him to do this. But Abraham trusted God. It's a three-day journey to Mount Moriah. Abraham brought three things with him. Yes, he had his servants, but he brought three things. A bundle of wood, a tinderbox of fire, and a knife. He lets Isaac carry the wood, and he carries the fire and the knife. Why? 
because they're dangerous and he didn't want Isaac to get hurt. Yet he knew what he was going there to do. Abraham built this altar and he placed Isaac upon the altar after strapping him down and he took the knife from its sheath. And as he reached up with the knife to bring it down on his son, suddenly Genesis 22, 11, 13 says, the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything for, to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up, and he saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. God did that in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve. Abraham finds a ram to sacrifice for his son. Animal for life. Animal for life. This was the crucial moment when a sacrifice was called for and God provided the ram in place of Isaac. For those of us who haven't grown up on a farm, a ram is a male sheep or a male goat. And it's a sacrifice that's used throughout the Bible. All right, we're going to go one more time. A second time, we're going to flip through to the next book of the Bible, the book of Exodus chapter 12. This is where the children of Israel are in slavery in Egypt. God wants to free them, so he presents Pharaoh with 10 powerful visual aids. Each were designed to demonstrate the power of God versus the power of the gods of Egypt. So chapter 12 tells the story of the 10th visual aid, the 10th plague. God is going to judge Egypt for their sins. But the Israelites have sinned too. So God says to Moses in Exodus 12, 3 through 7, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, not the first, the 10th day of the month, this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. They only have to keep it four days, folks. Four days. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So Moses relays this message to every Jewish household. So they adopt a lamb. They bring it to their home. They play with it. They name it probably if they were like my kids. They bond with it, and they love it. And four days later, the father of the household takes it out back and slits its throat. Imagine how the children are feeling. Dad, why did you do that? What did you do that to Fluffy for? He didn't do anything, kids. He was innocent. We did things that were wrong. We. And God said that we could pay for those ourselves, or we could substitute Fluffy for our sins. It was either Fluffy or one of us. That morning, there were moanings all throughout Egypt, in every household except those who sacrificed a lamb as a substitute to pay for their sins. You see, the Israelites were spared judgment by sacrificing this lamb. God's instructions in Exodus 12 were very simple. He told them, select an animal from the flock and slaughter it on the 14th day. Then he told them to take hyssop, dip it in the blood, and brush it on the lintel and the doorposts. See, when the angel of the Lord came through Egypt, if he saw those marks, 
He left everyone in that household alone. God knew what he was doing. And for the next 1,400 years, on the very same day, every Israelite brought a lamb into their home. And every household sacrificed a Passover lamb to cover all of their sins. Year after year after year. Why? Because they kept sinning. They're just like us. The lamb's sacrifice was never permanent. It was temporary. And people still longed for a permanent sacrifice. One that would pay for their sins once and for all. And these sacrifices continued as Israel moved into the promised land. It wasn't just the 40 years in the wilderness. It still happened when they entered the land of milk and honey because they continued to sin. They continued when they, were cap when they were captured and taken off to Babylon. They still did it in Babylon. It continued when they returned back to their homeland. Prophets came and went from time to time. There was further talk about lambs as sacrifices. Then one day, a prophet named Isaiah came. And when he did, he spoke about a suffering servant who would one day come and align the people so closely with God. And in our focus verse from this morning, 53, Isaiah 53, 7, it said, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. You still with me? Hope so. Isaiah said he would be like what? Little louder. There you go. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. He said he would be, that the Messiah would be like a lamb <laughs> to the slaughter. Like a lamb. A lamb. People began to scratch their heads. Could it really be that one day a lamb would become a man? They didn't know what to think. Nobody knew for sure. But there, it was written in their sacred text. On their scrolls, it was scribed. Centuries passed. People wondered. And every year, lambs were slaughtered. Until one day. Until one day when a carpenter from Nazareth left his building shop. And he journeyed south along the Jordan River. He came to a place where a man named John was baptizing people. John was in the middle of the water. When he looked up and he saw Jesus on the shore... Pointing in his direction, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was an electric moment. Mothers hugged their babies. Fathers cradled their sons. Hair stood up on the back of people's necks. This was the man who was the Lamb. And he was going to finally lift the weight of sin. Finally, Israel's Savior was there. John identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you know the rest of the story. The next three and a half years, Jesus went around teaching and preaching like no other. Jesus healed like no other. Jesus cared like no other. And in a story long recorded in the Bible, Jesus was led like a lamb to a place called Golgotha, where he suffered like a servant, and he died like no other, giving his life as a payment for the sins of the world. With his last bit of oxygen in his lungs, he looked around at all the people that were gathered there. He thought about them and the sins that they did. The sins that other people that would come after, like you and me, would do. And he whispered one word in Greek, three words in English, patelestai. In English, it is finished. 
And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. To tell us thy. This Greek word is what merchants wrote on the bottom of sales slips when someone paid their bill. To tell us thy means paid in full. No other payment is needed. Nothing ever more needs to be done to atone for the sins of the world. It is finished. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 12, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. See, the whole story of the Bible is a story about a lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. Your sin, my sin, permanently <clears throat> forgiven once and for all. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus returned to heaven to be seated at the position of power and authority at the right hand of the Father. We read in Revelation 5.13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The story of the history of our planet ends with the lamb now in heaven worshiped forever but church the story of our species doesn't end with the ending of our planet Jesus reigns in Revelation 5 but we're told more in Revelation 22 the final two chapters of the Bible say that one day not only will the lamb redeem the world but he'll create a new one. Revelation 21 calls it the new heaven and the new earth. If we look at 21, 23, it says, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it. And listen to this church. It's the lamp or the lamp is the lamp. Friends, the culmination of the story of the lamb concludes that the Lamb will one day light the new heaven and the new earth. The Lamb, Jesus. From the beginning to the end, it's critical to understand that it was a Lamb. There was a sect of society, the, the Moravians, that got serious about God. In the 18th century, they established a 24-hour-a-day prayer movement that ran uninterrupted for over 100 years. They sent out missionaries all over the world to proclaim the gospel. And one of their stories is about two young men who heard of an island that was a leper colony where no one there had heard the name of Jesus. Now, you all know that leprosy is highly contagious. So if you set foot on this island, you were never allowed to leave again. But these young men were determined to reach the lepers with the good news of Jesus Christ. So they convinced the delivery boat that dropped supplies off at the island to let them ride along. When the day came for the boat to leave, the Moravian brothers gathered to pray over these young men and send them off, never to see them again. There were a lot of tears and there was a lot of weeping. But as the boat cast off its lines, the young men waved one last time and they shouted to their brothers, may the lamb who was slain receive the glory of his suffering. And for 100 years, that was the battle cry of this brethren. May the lamb 
who was slain receive the glory of his suffering. Jesus allowed himself to be led to the slaughter because he saw everything you needed and determined to pay for it himself. This is the lamb that you can trust. Let him into your life. Let him into your heart. And let him pay for your sins. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for knowing in advance that we would need a way to you that only your son Jesus could provide. The lamb. The sacrificial lamb. Once and for all. The blood was shed so that we could live in eternity with you, God. Lord, as we go into communion here today, celebrating that Passover meal, that final time before the blood was shed for the last time, I just ask with everyone's head bowed, eyes closed, if anyone in this room right now doesn't have that redemption in their life right where you are just raise your hand i'm not going to ask you to come down i'm not going to ask you to, to to move just so we know for the rest of us that that know what that blood meant and and know that the power of that blood has cleansed us forever for our past for our present and our future we still make mistakes and that's why we need Jesus every day. I ask you all then to repeat after me so we can, we can share in the communion meal. Father God, I come before you today broken but redeemed, forgiven for everything that I've done. Lord, give me strength to continue your ways and show the world the light that comes from the Lamb. Thank you, Father, for making a way and accepting me for who I am and who you are turning me into. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your, your cups and if you peel back the first and take out the wafer, again, what this represents as Jesus told his disciples in the upper room that this was his body and his body would be broken for them. They didn't understand it. They didn't realize it was the very next day. They had no clue. The words he said made no sense to them, but it makes perfect sense to us because we now can see it on what he did. But after breaking the bread, he told them, every time you take of this, remember me. Okay. He then took the cup of wine and after blessing it, he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. They only knew of the covenant of Abraham. But Jesus says there's a new one. And it's my blood that covers that. This blood is the forgiveness of sins. Theirs, mine, yours. And as he shed that blood on Calvary that day, it was the final time that a lamb needed to be slaughtered. And he told them, every time you drink of this cup, remember me. Let us pray, Father God. You're just awesome. There's nothing else to say other than that one word. You are awesome. Prepare us, Father, for the triumphant entry of our Savior into the city of Jerusalem next week. As we start this holy week, let us be remembering who you are and what you did and what. Bless those that aren't here today, Father. Those that are, I ask you, 
a special blessing upon them as well. Bring them back to us again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So go forth into the world, loving God, loving people, and living your design. See you next week.